Um, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, I, like you mentioned, I am a scientist, a chemical engineer, and I'm going to talk to you um, about um, how to get more young Nigerian girls to pursue STEM. So technically, I am very much here for the girls. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> yes. So, um, first of all, um, I have questions like um, for the girls. How many girls here are in science class? Okay, so we, so we have a lot of girls this time. Yeah, which, which is good. Yeah, but um, we have seen a lot of the time that over the years, even the statistics say that uh, women, there are few women in science, technology, engineering, and math, which is STEM. So I have five points that um, hopefully will get you more girls to get into STEM and also would get, I guess, also the teachers to encourage girls to get into STEM. My first point is that uh, girls should be allowed to choose what they want to do based on what they have interest in and not what the society believes that they will fit in based on their personality. So um, when I was in secondary school, um, I'm not sure if that's how it works now, but when I was in secondary school, um, if you were chatty, you were extroverted, as, um, you like to talk, or you could write, they would just tell you, okay, you should go to art class. Yeah, you, you, you have nothing been in science. Um, if you were quiet, um, calm, then you fit, into, you fit more into the sciences. Unfortunately, for a lot of girls, a lot of girls are naturally chatty. You know, a lot of girls are extroverted. So then you start to think science is not for me. And then they tell you, you should study law. No offense to lawyers. You should become a newscaster. No offense as well. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, um, um, that, that, that leaves a lot of girls out of sciences. Now, when I was in secondary school, I happened to be a talk. I used to talk a lot as well. And um, yeah, I used to talk a lot as well. And my father also happened to be a lawyer. So automatically, it meant that uh, I should be in the arts class. Interestingly now, as you can see, I am a PhD student in one of the world's best universities studying a PhD in chemical engineering. And what I found out is this. First, a lot of the skills that um, we believe uh, makes people good art students are actually very, very required and very valued in STEM. For example, if you happen to talk a lot, you happen to be a very good communicator, this skill is very required um, in sciences because you want to be able to communicate your research. You want to be able to talk about um, your research for people to understand what you're talking about. Also, because um, I, I work in science research as well, you, if you happen to be, like I said, a good writer, then um, they would also banish you to the arts. But on the other hand, I've realized that um, even in the sciences, you need these writing skills to be able to communicate your research and write publications as well. So basically, some of these skills, a lot of these skills that have made people tell you that um, you would be a better art student, you would be good in art, actually even makes you a more better scientist. Interestingly too, I've worked with some of the world leading women researchers in science, and they happen to be extroverted, chatty, um, just extrovert. And um, the point is, I, I, I start to think like, what would have been their fate if they happen to study in Nigeria, where if you happen to be this kind of bubbly person, then you're kind of banished to the arts. Unfortunately too, a lot of young girls um, happen in their formative years, like I mentioned, happen to be really chatty and um, extroverted. So first, we need to first banish the idea that girls or people who are extroverted do not fit into sciences. You fit into sciences. My second point is um, that more women scientists and their accomplishments and discoveries are highlighted in secondary schools. Um, if you're a science student as a girl, you most likely have heard um, Boyle's law, Charles law, Gay-Lussac's law, Einstein's theory of relativity, all these people are men. And at a point, you start to think, aren't women discovering things? Are there no women in these things? Now, early this year, I read the autobiography of Jennifer Doudna. Jennifer Doudna won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2020 for discovering CRISPR, a gene editing tool. 
Now, um, if you have taken the COVID vaccine, then you have benefited from Jennifer Dudner's um, research. But what was interesting about this um, Jennifer Dudner's um, autobiography was how she got into science. Now, there was this guy, this man named James Watson. Him and three other men won the Nobel Prize several years ago um, for discovering the structure of the DNA. And um, Jennifer Dudner's father had given her um, James Watson's autobiography, The Double Helix. And now, while she read it, she was reading um, James Watson's autobiography, she found out about um, this lady, Rosalind Franklin. Apparently, during the time that um, these discoveries of um, the structure of the DNA was going on, Rosalind Franklin was also conducting research on the structure of the DNA. Unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin died. She passed away, so she wasn't able to win the Nobel Prize along with um, the, the three other guys. Now, um, what Jennifer Dudna, at that point, she realized first that um, reading that book, she realized so women could do world-class research and um, in biology as well. And then she decided that she was going to, um, you know, pursue research in biology. So, and, um, th and that's why we, most of us here, as long as you have taken the COVID vaccine, like I mentioned, you have benefited from Jennifer Dudna's research. I would also um, kind of extrapolate to myself. Um, I believe I'm conducting world-class research as well. And when I was in secondary school, like you all here, um, in a federal government college in Ogun State, um, this lady came and she was also an engineer. And she came to talk about what she does and, uh, as an engineer. I was, I believe, in GS3 or GS2 at the time. And she kept talking, and it was inspiring. She was feminine. She was everything that a conventional woman would be. And she was also an engineer. And it was inspiring. So first, I am going to implore um, teachers as well to talk about these people, talk about these women, show women that there are people that they can be like. Um, we need to tell women about the Marie Curies of this world the Rosalind Franklins of this world, the Jennifer Dudnads of this world, the hidden figures, and we need to let them know, these young girls, about their impact. So you know that there are scientists, engineers that are women, and that have made impact, and that you can be the same as well. My third point is um, that STEM programs, especially engineering ones, should not be portrayed as disciplines that require physical energy or masculinity, because they don't. Coming sincerely from a chemical engineer. Um, usually when you say you want to do math or engineering, people start to tell you um, you need strength. Or as a lady, they start to tell you um, you need to be strong, you need to be this, you need to be macho. No, you can be feminine. You can like to dress up. You can like to have wear makeup. You can like to cook. You can like to do all of those girly things and still be a scientist or an engineer. What you need to become any of these things is analytical thinking, focus, and a genuine interest in these fields, and not necessarily um, masculinity or having to be a tomboy or anything like that. And um, recently as well, we have seen more women become lady mechanics and excel in it. In fact, I, I dare say that a lot of people want to patronize female mechanics, and they have excelled well in it, despite the fact that for so long has been touted as um, something that mostly men should do. Now, um, also, my fourth point is, um, can we stop saying science is hard? Because genuinely, it is not. Um, and this is why. What happens is, um, for example, let me give another story of when I was in secondary school. When I was in secondary school, um, you have to choose to do further math. Some people have to elect to do further math. And the stories were, 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 were horrific. Like people tell you, your teachers, they start to tell you further math is hard, it's difficult, you have to be this, you have to be that. And then, you know, a lot of people don't even try. They don't even enter, they don't even go to further math class. So when I was in, when I was in secondary school, um, we were just three girls in further math class. Of course, the entire, because um, they had made it look so difficult, there were very few students in further math class in the first place. But there were even, even fewer girls. And, um, you know, now we, 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 we had fewer girls in further math class. And these girls never did further math, not because they failed out of it, but because they didn't even try. They weren't even allowed to try because they were already scared off of it. So I think that first, we need to allow students, we need to allow young people try. 
you need to allow them wade in the water. If you think you can do it, then try. If, especially if you have a genuine inter interest, you need to allow them try and not just judge them based on their personalities um, and all of that. That's um, one point. Um, the other point, which is for everybody, is um, I believe that um, personally that we should not let Junior YF determine a student's future. Um, when I was in secondary school as well, Junior Wayek, everybody knows Junior Wayek, and I, I've actually seen a lot of tweets where you, you see people say, um, what, is, what, is, what has been the relevance of Junior Wayek to you? Uh, I probably fall into this category as well, um, because um, this, this Junior Wayek of a thing, it kind of serves like a filter. It filters science students, who will be prospective science students from art students. So you do... In junior secondary school, I don't know where it is now, we used to do integrated science and intro and math. So you do integrated science and math and intro tech and that and your grades in that determine whether you are eligible to go into science class. Which is interesting because integrated science, you don't, you don't really do any chemistry, you don't really do any physics, but then if you don't pass integrated science, if you don't pass intro tech, they then banish you. Um, interestingly, too, my younger sister, um, she's currently in the university studying medical laboratory science. Interestingly, when she was at secondary school as well for her junior um, YF, she didn't really do well in integrated science. And I remember going with her to the, the second, to her school because she wanted to go into science class, but she didn't do well in integrated science and intro tech. So I remember going with her to her school and there was this lady that said, no, she's, you're going to fail. Just go and do law. You're going to fail out of it. You can't even pass integrated science. And so it's, it's interesting. Anyway, what happens eventually is this, a lot of students, maybe they don't pass integrated science. These are people in their early teens, less than teenagers. They don't pass this subject and then they go and um, go to art class. Unfortunately, once you go to senior secondary school, you are not able to pivot back because you've done, you've done art. It's very difficult, especially, except maybe you have people, you have these students who, has, who are strong-willed. It's difficult for them to then pivot back into, um, into the, the sciences, even if they had interest in it. Now, I have taught, I was a graduate teaching assistant in the United States, and what I did was... Um, I used to teach 100 level and 200 level students chemistry. And this was what I noticed. What I noticed was this. Some of these students, they used to have, in front of their names, they didn't have their degree. They had undecided. What this means is that they had not decided what degree they were going to do. So the, the university, at least the university system in the US, it allows you to take as many courses as you want in the sciences, in the arts, in business, for your 100 level and 200 level, you can be, even in the best universities, Harvard, MIT, you can do this. 100 level, 200 level, not deciding what you want to do. And these are people in early 20s or late, late teens. And that is when they are, giving, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are they are being allowed to decide what they are going to do. So it's interesting how we are making students take an exam at, before they are even teenagers, and that kind of decides what they are going to do for most of the rest of their life. So I, I, I humbly disagree with the idea that um, this exam kind of plays too much of a pivotal role. It's too trivial to let students decide what they are going to do for the rest of their lives. They need to still grow, mature, and um, be able to decide kind of what they are going to do for the rest of their lives. Now, finally, um, why I am a strong proponent of getting women in science is because women in science can solve women problems. There are some problems that are only specific to women. For example, and um, I'm going to extrapolate. You know, sometimes you, most of us have probably heard this saying where they say, um, if, you, if malaria was, or sickle cell was an ailment that affected white people, they will probably have a cure for it because, you know, they, they, they don't know, they, they are, most of them are the researchers, they, are, they, they, they do very well in research. And, um, if it was something that affected them, they definitely would find a cure for it. And I think it's similar to even women issues. There are some issues that just women face, like um, fibroids, endometriosis, breast cancer. And um, women in science, only women know how these things feel. And um, as a result, women know that how, how, how much of an issue it is to us. And so it is just you 
if you get into STEM, then you have the potential to be able to solve these problems for us and not just leave it to people who don't really understand, no offense to men, who don't really understand, um, you know, how these things feel, how much of an impact these um, ailments or diseases are to us. Um, so um, on a final note, I'm going to say that um, with more women in STEM fields, we're more likely to develop solutions to women issues. This is in addition to not just being childbearers and homemakers, but active contributors to innovation and development. A woman can be many things, and uh, a scientist can be one of them. Thank you. <laughs>